Hi there, Charlie Lees here, gastroenterologist, professor of gastroenterology here in the Edinburgh IBD unit. Well, on Thursday evening, just having come out of the today's IBD clinic with our excellent team, thinking about how our patients have been today, many doing very well now, some clearly still struggling, be it through symptoms or ongoing inflammation or troublesome quality of life or, or other issues that we're doing our best to manage. So it's September 2024 and I think I thought it'd be useful to reflect on where we are just now from a clinical point of view through research, what we're understanding and where our big gaps are and how we're addressing these in the UK and beyond moving forwards. Because really now I think we are at a, an almost historic moment. We're understanding more and more about the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease, work from ourselves in Edinburgh, others around the UK, from the Canadian team that have been so influential here, but also importantly, colleagues from throughout both the developed and the developing world, we see that almost now one in a hundred people are living with inflammatory bowel disease. Our data show that by 2028, we will breach the 1% mark here. And that projects, I think, across to the whole of the United Kingdom. So here we are with that 400, 500,000 people plus in the UK living with inflammatory bowel disease at some point in their lives. And many of these people are getting older. Older patients often come with significant issues of their own with multimorbidity, polypharmacy, frailty, and other issues indeed. Although we're still diagnosing most people young in life, we're not undiagnosing people yet. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis remain lifelong and incurable. And for many people, as lots of you will know, it can be devastating and intrusive. But with new treatments, well, with effective therapy, and indeed with many of the new treatments we have, we can see very, very good and sustained results indeed for the long term. So that's the epidemiology in the UK, across Europe, in North America. Fascinatingly, we're seeing the incidence, new cases of IBD surging elsewhere in the world. We're seeing this across South America. We're seeing this in Southern and Far East Asia, in the Middle East, and more recently also across Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at the projections over time, over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years, by far and away the majority of the people living with IBD across the world will be in what are currently developing countries. And as these countries industrialize, adopting a Western lifestyle, we're seeing IBD cases surge. So what is it that's driving this? Well, we understand the genetics very well. We've contributed tens of thousands of people. We're living with IBD with genetic samples and phenotyping from the UK to the international efforts, where now over 100,000 patients have been genotyped. The latest genetic studies this year have shown that we have over 650 individual points in the genome associated with susceptibility to inflammatory bowel disease. And this is giving us really fantastic clues as to not just the underlying biology, but also to ways that we can drug inflammatory bowel disease, the drug targets that are elucidated by the genetics. Many, if not all, of the current drugs that we use for IBD, anti-TNFs, JAK inhibitors, IL-1223 inhibitors like the new P19s, these all have strong evidence of genetic susceptibility. So these genetic studies have been very important and will continue to be so as we move towards new therapies. But our genetics are relatively stable, so that doesn't explain these epidemiological shifts. What does? Well, we've seen data in the last year or so that shows that exposure to antibiotics early in life seems to be very important. We're seeing new evidence for diet. There have been a few studies in the last couple of years that have shown an association between intake of ultra-processed foods and the incidence of Crohn's disease, but not ulcerative colitis. This is just one factor. It doesn't mean that UPFs cause Crohn's disease, far from it. Many of people that live with Crohn's disease have never eaten 
bad foods. So it's not the culprit, but it is a clue and a contributing factor. And indeed, if we could find more about this, this would help us enormously moving forward. We here in Edinburgh were very interested to find out whether or not diet had a role in disease course, in fact, in disease flare. And we've been working very hard this year to understand the totality of the data we generated from the PREDICT study with two and a half thousand people from 50 UK sites recruited um, in the 2017 to 2020 time point and then followed for four years. And at baseline, when we recruited people, we did dietary surveys, surveys as well as looking at genetics, the microbiome, clinical environmental factors. And we found some very interesting things indeed. It looks like eating too much meat increases the risks of having flares in ulcerative colitis. We've also found evidence that depression and lack of physical activity also increases the risk of flares in ulcerative colitis, independent of other factors, including inflammation level, which would otherwise be a key driver for flares. So those are just a couple of insights in terms of what we've learned from the epidemiology, from the genetics, from some of the environmental studies that are going on. We are getting closer to understanding what is causing inflammatory bowel disease. And indeed, there's a lot of research effort going on globally to try and unravel the preclinical phases of inflammatory bowel disease so that we might ultimately be able to predict it moving forward. What could we do if we could predict inflammatory bowel disease in advance? Well, then we might be able to think about prevention. And when we think about the two big moonshots for IBD, on the one side we've got prevention, and on the other side we've got cure or cures. So what might those things look like moving forward? Well, that's interesting. From a prevention point of view, maybe it's dietary on one part, maybe it's avoiding key things early on like antibiotics, but it may be treatment in higher risk individuals in the short term. And we're looking at some of the newer data that's showing some antibody signatures and some other blood signatures and even microbiome signatures that can be identified up to 10 years before a diagnosis for a person with Crohn's disease and on a sh slightly shorter timeline for people with ulcerative colitis. There's some really amazing science going on here and this is definitely a space to keep an eye on moving forwards over the next period of time. So prediction and prevention of IBD, maybe not so crazy an idea as we had thought maybe 10 years ago. What about this key thing about personalized medicine? Well, following on from the genetic studies, this is something we've had a keen interest on in the UK. And the, there are a couple of really brilliant studies that are underway and gonna start soon. We've got the IBD response study and the IBD open study. These are both collaborative pan-UK studies being led by Chris Lamb in Newcastle from a clinical standpoint, and Carl Anderson and his team of brilliant statistical and computational geneticists and scientists at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge. The IBD response study has recruited about half of its 1,500 patients to date. And here what we're doing is looking at people before they start an advanced therapy for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And in these individuals, we're looking primarily to the gut microbiome to see if we can identify signatures that are associated with response or non-response when we follow people over time. So that's a very important study that's underway and hoping to complete recruitment at some point towards the, 20, the end of 2025. And then we have the IBD open study where we're going to be doing an inception cohort, a true state-of-the-art inception cohort. We'll take 2,000 individuals before even they've had their first endoscopy. We'll aim that 1,000 of those have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And here what we're doing is we're using the very latest scientific techniques called single cell sequencing, where you separate all the different cell types for a biopsy. You sequence the genomes of every single one of those cells and then you can start to get to the necessary resolution 
to look to see if there are predictors of bad disease outcomes, disease course, moving forwards. And that reminds me of one other pivotal study that we've seen published in full this year, and that was the result of the profile study. Many of you will have seen this data that was presented at the ECHO meeting at the start of this year, 2024. And here what we saw was the really dramatic effect of early effective therapy with infliximab and azathioprine in this top-down approach for individuals with Crohn's disease. And this is going to have really dramatic effects in what we see for outcomes for Crohn's patients moving forwards. Something we've done in Edinburgh already for 10 years, we already see in our data a decrease in surgery, a decrease in hospitalizations, and better clinical outcomes in our patients when we start drug therapy very early. But there have been lots of big pockets around the UK and globally where people have got onto effective therapies far too late, and this is something we will now be able to change. And effective therapies are something that we have a plenty in 2024. And critically, they're not all as expensive as they used to be. We've had biosimilar infliximab and adalimab, our two key anti-TNF drugs, for quite some time now, almost 10 years now. This year, ustekinumab or Stelara will go biosimilar, and that will increase our ability to use that early on. We've seen some of our newer medicines not priced as crazily as expensive as they were in the past. We've seen that with some of our JAK inhibitors, these small molecules, and the S1P receptor modulators. There are two of those, Ozanimod and Atrazimod, that are competitively priced. With the JAK inhibitors, Tofacitinib, Filgotinib, and Upalacitinib, we're seeing drugs that work super fast and are available like upalacitinib for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Drugs that work within days, so we're able to use less steroids that can be so damaging and harmful if given inappropriately to our patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And now we're also seeing the advent, this new era with the P19 molecules. This is mirakizumab for UC, it's rizankizumab for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and next year we'll see gazelkumab, the third of these for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis too. And indeed many of our patients in clinic today on a new JAK inhibitor or on a new P19 and doing very well indeed. And the pipeline is healthy as well. There's a lot of excitement in industry about new drugs for inflammatory bowel disease, and I think we are seeing a lot of these coming through phase two and indeed phase three testing. And I'm looking forward to seeing how, they will, how the results of these will pan out moving forwards. So there's a lot of hope and optimism for me there and a huge pride that we are driving much of this forward under great leadership in the UK, thanks to the BSG, thanks to Crohn's and Colitis UK and many other key organisations but we still have a big unmet need. We have too many of our patients who are not doing well enough. There are some key areas here like perianal fistulizing Crohn's disease, the efforts from Elsa Hart, Phil Toza, and Seb Shadji and Nick Powell, where we've got significant investment now and are collecting under the guise of the Gondoma study, individuals with perianal Crohn's disease taking samples and looking to see how we can understand the biology better to get better therapies. Fibrotic or stricturing Crohn's disease, a lot of work going on here. We'll need to see how we can get to therapies for this in the future moving forwards. And then finally, other areas that I'm really excited about, digital telemonitoring, the use of smart technologies, and artificial intelligence, which is making huge inroads in what we're able to do both in terms of large language models that are going to be helpful for phenotyping large numbers of patients and providing really hyper-personalized communication tools with chatbots and the like. Predictive analytics, that's the bit I'm really interested in. How can we take big data sets like Tesco does or DHL does to optimize supermarket shelves, deliveries and outputs? How can we take that to optimize and improve and predict 
what's going to happen to an individual moving forward. And then AI employed to image, so in colonoscopy and pathology and radiology, to transform reporting and our understanding, not only from a conventional sense, but to get more data moving forwards. So that's it from me now, 15 minutes summarizing some insights from the clinic, some insights from research, highlighting to you what we've been able to do in the UK and moving forwards. There is a lot of work to do, but there are a lot of brilliant people working super hard to try and address these issues. And I think we will continue to see step change for sure um, and some big changes moving forwards. Are we close to predicting and preventing IBD? No, but a roadmap is now clearly evolving to get us there. Are we close to a cure or cures for IBD? Probably also no, but we are making progress and maybe one day soon I'll be able to come back here with a really important, exciting update from that too. So enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thanks very much. Goodbye.